So this is our lecture on within subjects designs. Remember we're going to have all of this content available in, in this one slideshow due to that inclement weather day. Um, so all of the within subjects designs will be in this one slideshow. Um, remember, within subjects designs are different than between subjects designs in that within subjects designs we're conducting the entire experiment essentially within each participant. Whereas previously we were looking at between groups of participants and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in some of these subsequent slides. So again, just to, to recap from where we've been, when we're doing experimental research, we have to make the decision of who and how we will measure our variables, who we're going to measure, how we're going to do it. Are we going to ask different people? Each person then is only giving one data point, and then we have that independent groups or between subjects design. Are we asking the same people both questions? Um, if that case, we have the multiple data points from the same individual and we have a within subjects or repeated measures design. Now it's again important, just like in between subjects and independent groups are synonymous, within subjects and repeated measures are synonymous. Um, that will be very helpful when we get to the statistics portion um, because the t-test and the ANOVAs are usually referred to as repeated measures. So again, within subjects and repeated measures because we're getting repeated data points on the same individual. So back to our little graphs that we had before. Again, when we were doing between subjects design, we were looking between two groups of individuals. Um, and we would get a data point from each individual. If we had 10 subjects in each group, we would have a total of 20 participants. And we would look at the difference between these two groups. Um, is the treatment group different than the control group? And we were looking at this um, collectively. Um, when we look at within subjects, each study is happening, the study is the whole study, both conditions are happening within each subject. So in this, again, little graphic, each colored star represents a different individual. And we'll maybe do a study where we're doing before and after. And we'll get a data point from each individual from both a before and an after. So this is repeated measures designed because, again, we're getting data points from them at two periods of time. This could also be, again, they're getting the control group and the experiment group, um, but the point is that we're getting multiple data points from one individual in a within subjects design, whereas in a between subjects design we only have one data point from each individual. And again, and these within subjects or repeated measures designs, we're again then looking at the difference within this. Um, within subjects design allow us to control for the main issue of between subjects design, which is individual differences. By, allow, by testing the same person twice, um, we're allowing them to kind of be their own control. And so the variability that we're getting due to individual differences in between subjects variable, in between subjects designs, is basically canceled out and it kind of falls at the bottom because we're testing, we're comparing everybody to themselves. And so we'll have the same amount of variability in each group because each group is essentially the same because it has the same number of individuals. Then the only thing that's really being allowed to change um, is our manipulation of the independent variable. So in repeated measures or within subjects design, again, each participant um, is gets each condition of the experiment. So if we have 20 participants and we have three conditions, we will have each of the 20 participants will participate in each of the three conditions. So we'll end up with 60 data points from 20 individuals. Whereas if we had done that same thing with the between subjects design and we had three conditions and we needed 20 individuals in each condition, we would have had 60 different individuals participate. We'd still have 60 data points, um, but the difference is we had to do six, do 60 different people to get those same 60 data points with a within subjects design. Um, we get, um, again, to get multiple data points from one individual. So the participant will complete the dependent variable and will measure them on the dependent variable in each of the conditions. And that's, again, why we're calling it repeated measures, because we're measuring them repeatedly. Um, so again, our dependent variable is what we're measuring, and so we're repeatedly measuring them on some um, variable. Again, this is also called a within subjects design because the entire experiment is conducted within 
each participant. So again, we can have Joe, and he participates in all three of our conditions. And so we've essentially done the entire experiment within Joe. Um, and we'll go ahead and do the whole entire experiment within Sally, and within Frank, and within Francis, until we have um, the total number of participants that we need. This is a graph from your book um, that really does a nice job of demonstrating that. So we have one sample of participants. Remember in a between subjects design, if we had three conditions, we would have three samples of participants. Um, or we would have one sample that was divided into three. Here again, we just have one sample of participants, and they're measured in on the dependent variable for treatment condition one, they're measured on the dependent variable for treatment condition two, and they're measured on the dependent variable for treatment condition three. So again, we're getting multiple data points. We're getting three data points from every single participant. Um, again, this allows us to have a lot fewer participants in our study, um, which can be really, really beneficial, especially when you're working with a special population. Um, or a population that's not as cooperative. Um, but it's also is really good because it again is reducing or eliminating these individual differences because we have the same people participating. And we'll work through how that works um, in some of these subsequent slides. So why do we do this? What's the whole point? Why not just stick with our simple between subject design? Again, we lose the we lose the issue of individual difference. We no longer have to worry about balancing these individual differences across all the various conditions of the experiment because everybody's participating in all of the conditions of the experiment. Um, so we no longer have that, that issue. We don't have to worry about um, really randomization or trying to match these people in some specific way because we have, um, again, they're participating in all of them. So whatever our variability of individual differences is for um, treatment group one, because it's the same group of people, that variability will be the same for treatment group two and treatment group three, because we're doing the same people. This creates a situation where we have a lot more, a lot less noise. That variability due to individual differences is eliminated which is great because that makes a lot less noise in our signal to noise ratio. And we'll talk about that in a bit. We also need fewer participants. Um, again, very important um, when you're doing studies with populations that are harder to get. Um, you'll see a lot of times developmental studies try to do um, within subjects designs um, because again, sometimes those populations are a little bit harder to work with. Um, we do between subjects designs when we can't do in, um, within subjects designs for what whatever particular reason. And we'll talk about some of those issues with internal validity that would make us need to do a between subjects design rather than a within subjects design. Um, again, they're convenient and efficient. We've got less work to do, um, which is everybody uh, usually appreciates. Um, they're usually cost less. Um, instead of having to have 60 different sessions, you only have to have 20 different sessions for three conditions. Um, so again, it takes a lot less time. It takes a lot less effort. Um, and then that translates to a lot less money too. And again, they are more sensitive. And the reason that these, and what we mean by sensitivity is, sensitivity is the ability to see an effect of your independent variable in your study. And they're more sensitive because we have less variability. We have less noise. Again, the noise is what can block that signal in that signal to noise ratio. So it's more sensitive because we have less variability and less noise, we can see that signal better. Um, and we can see how that works um, in this um, table from your book. So this is table 9-1 in your text. And it shows you um, two sets of data using the exact same numerical scores. Um, so the top one is a between subjects design experiment where we have three different groups. And so you see we have different names for different individuals. Um, where the second one, B, is a within subjects experiment and we have one group has all the same, um, was in all three same treatments. And you can see the same names are in all three columns. Again, notice that the values here are the same for both of them. We had the 20, the 30, the 51, the 62, and the 41, and our mean of 41. We have a mean of 45 here and a mean of 45 here. The numbers are identical in both of these experiments. But the difference in these two experiments is the top one, any of that variability, any of those differences between 41, 45, and 49 can be due to two things. It can be due to our um, 
hopefully, our effect of the, uh, our manipulation of the independent variable, but it could also be due to individual differences. Whereas in treat in within subjects design, the differences between 41, 45, and 49 can't be due to individual differences because there aren't any. We've eliminated that as an issue. So really any of the differences that we're getting then um, really have to, not have to be, but are hopefully due to our manipulation of the independent variable. So again, um, we see the difference. We've reduced the noise. And in this um, example, again, we're dealing with the exact same numbers. But the numbers on the top are noise and signal. And the numbers in the bottom are primarily just signal um, because we're able to eliminate so much of that noise um, due to individual differences. There still is variability. There still is noise. Um, but they're going to be more of kind of the experimental errors and those sorts of things. And then not due to the individual differences that we had um, in issue with before. So again, a sensitive experiment um, is an experiment where we can detect the effect of an independent variable. Um, again, can we see that signal in the noise? And that's true even if our signal is very small. So even if whatever our treatment effect is, is very small, um, it's our ability to see that. Again, if we have a very small treatment effect and we have lots and lots of variability, it's going to be hard to see that treatment effect. Um, if we have a very small treatment effect and we have very little variability because we were able to eliminate individual differences, we're going to be better able to see that signal, that effect, um, which, is which is why um, within subjects designs that eliminate the issue of individual differences are more sensitive. Again, they're more sensitive for a number of reasons. We've reduced this error variation, this error variation due to individual differences because we have the same participants in each condition as opposed to having um, different participants in each condition where we have individual differences then within a, a between subjects design. We don't have that in a repeated measures or within subjects design because the same people are participating in each condition. The variability due to individual differences has been eliminated from a within subjects design. And that's the number one benefit of a within subjects design is we're able to get rid of that. We're able to get rid of that and we're able to have a lot less variability so we have a more sensitive experiment where we can look at our signal. We can look for our signal with a lot less noise than we can in a between subjects design. There are disadvantages to these, just like there are disadvantages to between subjects design, but there are different kinds of disadvantages um, than we had in within subjects and between subjects design. We have time-related factors in um, within subjects design, and we'll go into those in a little bit more detail. And we also have attrition. Attrition is again that drop out, um, and so we can have people drop out um, of a condition of the the study kind of part way through, and then we have data points for them maybe on two of the conditions but not all three um, and then attrition has the same then issue um, as a problem of creating these unequal groups that we have in um, between subjects design but the problem in here is that attrition is a greater risk because these experiments are typically a little bit longer for each participant because they're getting the entire experiment instead of just a, por a portion of it um, so attrition becomes a greater risk in within subjects design than it is in between subjects design because again these are a little bit longer and so they have a lot we're asking more of the participant the threats to internal validity for within subjects design still include the confounds from the environmental variables. Um, so they're the same kinds of things that we had to worry about in the between subjects design. Things like time of day, different rooms, um, and we control these just the same way that we do in between subjects design. So there still is noise in our, in our, um, in our signal to noise ratio in a within subjects design, but it's just far, far limited because it's really dealing with these environmental variables strictly um, and the noise is then not due to individual differences. Where in between subjects design we have environmental variables and individual differences in our noise and within subject design we only really have environmental variables. Our confounds due to time related factors um, include things like history, maturation, instrumentation, testing effects, and statistical regression and these next slides will go into those in each in more detail. So history is when an event occurs at the same time as the treatment and changes the participants behavior. 
Um, a participant's history includes other things in the, tr the treatment. And because they're happening at the same time, it's really different, difficult to then tear apart and to pull apart um, whether it was the treatment that has an effect or it was this fact of history. So if we were doing a study that um, was looking at contraceptive use um, and education on sexually transmitted diseases. And we had a treatment group and we did, we did kind of what the contraceptive use was before the study and what the contraception was used after the study. Um, and again, we're doing some sort of manipulation where we're um, creating, um, you know, a, 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 an education program on sexually transmitted disease and contraceptive use. So we do this manipulation and we find this really great effect. Um, the problem is, is that somewhere along in, in, in the course of our study, in the same time period, um, a major celebrity comes out as being HIV positive um, because of not using contraceptives. Um, and so we have this effective history. It's happening at the same time as the treatment it can be changing the participant's behavior. So we don't then know if it's because our treatment, our education program on contraceptive use and sexually transmitted diseases is what helped, or is it the fact that this celebrity came out um, as HIV positive from not using contraceptives? So that would be an example of history. Maturation. Um, is just that participants change over time. Um, and this can be more of an issue in um, in developmental studies um, because participants are changing a lot more over time. Um, but maturation is, is an issue of internal validity for all within subjects designs because we all change. We never, we, we're not done developing at, you know, 18 or 21 or, or anything like that. Let's hope not. Um, but uh, so this is this natural change that occurs over time. And these changes, so just the fact that we are changing and we are getting better at things um, in general, may be what's causing any changes during the experiment and not actually due to our treatment effect at all. It may just be the difference. And these are, again, examples of these time-related kinds of issues. Um, because our experiment is taking time, taking more time because it's within subject design, we're more susceptible to these kinds of threats. Um, again, it could just be that we got better at whatever it is. Um, if we're doing um, a study uh, where we're trying to manipulate um, how well a, um, a study program is working um, for students and we're again testing them before and after um, and but Regardless, we should see study improve over uh, over a period of time. If we're looking at it over the course of a year, um, and and we're doing this this treatment as education on study ways um, over the year, we would expect them to have gotten better at studying over a year of school period, um, which is again an example of maturation. So then, do our the differences that we're seeing at the end of those year is that due to maturation or is it due to our manipulation of the independent variable? Instrumentation, um, we use a whole bunch of different instruments to measure participants' performance. And these instruments may change over time. And that, in psychology, a lot of times includes the observers, the people that are doing the actual recording, that are recording behaviors, that are looking at looking times, that are doing these sorts of things. The first time that you're an observer for a study, you're not going to be as good as the last time you're an observer for that same study. And that's an example of instrumentation. Um, that we might become um, better at it, or we might be get really bored at it. <laughs> um, both of those things can be at play here. Um, we're tired, we just want the study to be over, um, or we've just gotten really good at it. Both of those can cause um, changes in instrumentation. Then we can see again, the changes that we see in any of the participants' performance may again then be due to instrumentation and not due to our manipulation of independent variable. And so once again, that threatens internal validity because we're no longer able to say with certainty that it's our manipulation that's caused this change on the dependent variable because it really may have to do with our um, instrumentation in this example. Testing is also an issue. Um, 
taking a test generally affects subsequent testing. So at the beginning of every semester, um, when you take your first test for an instructor, it's usually not your best test for that instructor because you're trying to figure out and what this instructor's test looks like, what they're, what they're asking for, the kinds of questions that they're asking, the kinds of answers that they're looking for. Um, and you're much better at taking that instructor's tests at the end of the semester because you've taken several of them. So taking a test affects subsequent testing. So then we have this situation that it just may be that you've taken this test so many times. Um, you're really familiar with the measures, you're really familiar with how it works, um, and so you're better at it. And in the case of something like within subject design, the test is going to be the same. Um, if I gave you the same test every single time, I would hope, and it was on statistics, I would hope by the time we got to the you know third time or the fourth time taking that test, you'd be much better at that uh, at those that test than you must get a much better score at that test. If it was the exact same test than you did at the very first test. Because um, again, taking a test makes you better at taking tests. Um, and so we can see that then as an effect that can threaten our internal validity. Statistical regression is the idea that um, that this regression to the mean. Um, so if you have really high score or a really low score, um, that's generally not going to hold up over time. Um, it could be due to luck. It could be due to you had a head cold the first time you did it, um, any of those kinds of things. Um, and because these chance factors are not likely to be repeated during a second test, um, the next scores won't be so extreme. We'll have that regression towards the mean. Um, we'll be closer towards average performance. Um, so I guess this, again, this regression towards the mean, and this is something that we see not just in research, but in, in the world as a whole, this regression to the mean idea. Um, so if you have, you know, two really, really, really tall parents, sometimes their kids not that tall um, because we can have this regression towards the mean. Um, and, and again, this this just has, it's just a, a worldwide kind of phenomenon we see in lots of things. But it include we can see it in these kinds of studies as well. And because, again, we're getting multiple measures on individuals, this is, an, again, another time-related factor where we... Um, we may be likely to get kind of one outlier score from someone, but we're not likely to get three or four outlier scores from someone. We may get one extreme score um, and then other scores be more, um, be more average. Um, then in this situation, it's these regression effects. And again, not our manipulation of the independent variable that's causing these differences on the dependent variable. Um, so again, this is threatening internal validity because we're no longer able to say that it's our IV that's causing the, the, the change, not on our DV, um, because it really may be this sort of statistical regression. Um, order effects or testing um, effects, we call testing effects order effects for within subjects designs because they're getting all of the conditions um, and we are in charge of which order they're getting the conditions in. Um, and which order they're getting the conditions in um, can really influence um, what's the kind of performance. So behavior at one point maybe influenced again by this order of the sequence. Um, so again, you're better at taking the test the last time you take it. Your um, effects of history, effects of instrumentation, your experimenter's bored now that we're at the end, or your experimenter's really good now that we're at the end. Um, so again, these kinds of things are, um, are these testing effects. And we call them order effects because we can control them by altering the order of the experiment, by equally distributing the conditions over time um, for different participants or within a participant um, so that we can really get good information um, where we're able to really control for these kinds of testing effects. These can include things like carryover effects, which are changes that are caused by act after effects of a previous condition. Um, so if you've got treatment one and treatment two, it may be that you're doing better after treatment two, but it might just be that carryover effect from treatment one. Treatment one was really helpful. Um, and you're still kind of learning from treatment one, even though you're in treatment two now. Um, so again, carryover effects are something that we'll see and we'll talk about. Progressive error includes changes in behavior related to 
different kinds of experiment experiences for participating in research. Um, just again, the idea that progressively we're going to see these changes in behavior. Um, these can include practice effects. We just get better at it because we've done it more often. Um, but they can also include fatigue. We're getting worse at it because I'm tired. Um, both of these things are can be an issue. And so both of these things are, are called progressive error because as the experiment progresses, um, we're likely to have more error, more variability um, due to something outside of our, inter of our manipulation of the independent variable because of either we're getting better at it because of practice or we're getting worse at it because we're tired. Um, both of those things um, count. And these time-related factors or these um, these order effects, so these practice effects, are our main disadvantage of, um, of, of within subjects to science. People change as they're tested repeatedly. They improve or decline. Um, and again, they may get better over time. They may get worse over time. Um, and because these are allowed to then can vary with our dependent variable, and if they're allowed to systematically vary with our dependent variable, if we're always doing condition four last, um, well, then maybe it really is condition four they're just doing the best at. Or maybe it's just that we've had cumulative practice effects. So by the time we get to condition four, I'm just really good at this test. Um, and so I'm doing so much better. Um, so if we need to then what we need to do um, is control for them and have condition four sometimes at the beginning, sometimes at the end, sometimes at the middle, and really balance condition four over time for different participants or within the same participant so that we can really um, control for this and balance the, that variability out um, so that, again, um, is no longer allowed to systematically vary um, with or co-vary with either our independent variable or our dependent variable. So an example of this is suppose a researcher compares two different study methods, A and B. In condition A, um, participants are using a highlighter to mark the key points while reading the test. And then they text, and then they have to take a test on the material. In condition B, participants read a text and then make up a sample text questions and answer them, and then they take the test. So in this example, suppose that all participants first experience A, the highlighter condition, and then B, the um, um, write sample questions condition. Results indicate that scores are higher in A compared to B. Is it really just marking the text with a highlighter um, is better than writing sample questions? It's really impossible to know. We can't know because we've allowed all these time-related factors, um, such as practice effects, such as um, all of these kinds of things, instrumentation, history, maturation, all of these we've allowed to co-vary um, with the presentation um, of our um, independent variable. So because we've allowed these things to co-vary and they're not equally distributed over condition A and condition B, um, we don't know if it really is condition A is a better way to study. Um, I guess would be it's not. Um, or if it really is um, just these practice effects that are really um, accounting for the poor um, poor performance in condition B. You know, if you've already read a text, studied it, took a test, then you have to read a text study it, make up questions, take a test, you're going to be tired by the time you get to that second test. Um, and so it may just be that they're really tired when we get there. Um, and it has nothing to do um, with that A is a better study method than B. Here's a figure from your book um, that shows hypothetical data on how these order effects can distort the results of our study. Um, so in um, example A, we have the original scores with no order effect for treatment 1 and treatment 2. Um, so here we have both groups have a mean of 20, um, so we're not going to have any difference between treatment 1 or treatment 2. In B, we have modified scores, and we're pretending that we have a, an order effect that gives us kind of five points. We've gotten better at whatever our test is, um, and so we get five more points than we did before. Then it looks like um, treatment two um, is better. We're doing better at treatment two than treatment one, but it really is this order effect that's creating the situation. So then what we need to do is really balance those order effects out over both groups of data um, so that they cancel each other out. Um, and so we need to balance these or average these across conditions. And we do this by counterbalancing. And it distributes the practice offense 
equally across various conditions. So half the participants will do A and then B. The remaining half the participants will do B and then A. So some of the participants get um, highlighting first and then writing the sample questions, while the other half of the participants get writing the sample questions first and then highlighting. So if it really is just you're tired by the time you get to the second test, um, that will, because we have the second test both for B and A with a different group of participants, um, we're able to say, well, it's not just fatigue because we have this different, we've, we've accounted for that, we've uh, controlled for that by counterbalancing um, the order of the conditions. Because now A and B have equivalent practice effects. Half of the participants got A and then B, the other half got B and then A. We can't eliminate these practice effects, but again, they're averaged across the condition. Just like in um, between subjects design, we couldn't eliminate individual differences for between subjects, but we could average those individual differences, hopefully over the two groups, with randomization. Here we're averaging practice effects over the two groups through counterbalancing. So here's our same sample data again. Um, and, or not our same, but it's a very similar one where we have no tr order effect. Um, and the second one, we have an order effect of five. Whoever participates second gets an, an, an added five. Um, and here we add, we, we add that five, but we add it equally to both groups. And because we've added that five equally to both groups, um, we can see the difference. So you can see here, we've added the five here, um, and then the five gets added to treatment group one. And again, we've added equally. So each group in, in this example got 20 extra points um, it, that went into their average. Um, but they both equally got 20 um, extra points. So it was averaged across both conditions. Um, and then our differences between the 22 and a half and 28 and a half aren't just due to practice effects. They also can then be due to our manipulation of the independent variable because we've controlled for practice effects by averaging them equally over the two conditions. There are two types of repeated measures designs that allow us to counterbalance these practice effects. We have complete and incomplete. The purpose of each type is to counterbalance these practice effects. They're doing the same thing. Um, they just do it in a little bit different ways, and we have different kind of availability or options to use them depending on the kind of study we're doing, the kind of questions we're asking, the length of our test, those sorts of things. And as you would guess, they're each using different procedures for counterbalancing these practice effects. The end goal is the same. Either way, we've counterbalanced these practice effects. They're just doing it differently in each um, complete versus incomplete. So in incomplete, we have each participant only receives a partial order of each condition. So if we have three conditions, A, B, and C, participant one gets C, B, and A, and participant two gets C, A, B. Um, each time they got all the conditions and they got different orders so that we're trying to, again, um, balance these practice effects. We're in a complete um, counterbalancing. Um, each participant receives every order of all conditions. So they're still getting all conditions, but they're getting every order. So participant one gets ABC, CBA, BCA, BAC, ACB, CAB. So they're getting lots and lots and lots of presentations so that this is not only balanced across participants, it's balanced within each participant. Um, so this really is allowing the most averaging um, for practice effects, but obviously it's not always very um, applicable. Sometimes you can't, if you've got a really lengthy study, you can't do this. You can only do complete um, when your manipulation is very, very quick and very, very short. So again, um, each participant experiences one, each condition of the experiment um, exactly once. Um, in a complete, for a, that's for an incomplete design. For a complete design, they're getting it more than once. Um, practice effects are balanced across participants in an incomplete design. So again, we'll have, um, as you saw in that image before, we had five participants got 
um, the practice effect in group one and five participants got the practice effect in group two. Um, and that's what we're doing in an incomplete design. In a complete design, the practice effects are balanced within each subject because they're getting all orders um, of each one. Um, those practice effects are being averaged and balanced within each subject and then across subjects as well. Um, so it is a it is more complete way to counterbalance, um, but it is definitely more time consuming. So back to our goldfish crackers. Um, we've missed them so. Um, an incomplete example would be participant one um, gets the order C, B, and A. So they get the original goldfish cracker, followed by the pretzel goldfish cracker, followed by the cheese goldfish cracker. Cracker, and that's all they get. They've gotten all three conditions, um, and they and and then the next participant will get a different order, and the next participant will get a different order, and we'll make sure that all orders are accounted for. Um, but each participant's only getting one order, and they're only experiencing each condition once. We're in a complete counterbalancing um, within a in a within subjects design. Um, each participant is getting all possible orders um, of a of the conditions. So here we would have um, participant one would get A B C C B A B C A B A C A C B C A B. So that would look like cheese, pretzel, original, original, pretzel, cheese pretzel, original, cheese, and so on and so on until we completed um, that whole order and we had all possible orders.